Uh, hey, it's uh, John Reed. I'm live from SAP Controlling 2017 with a very interesting podcast guest who's, uh, shall we say, disrupting SAP Consulting in some really interesting ways. It's Paul Ovigel. How's it going? Very well, John. How are you? I'm good. And you have a, a really deep background in SAP Finance and Controlling, which is kind of why we're here. Yes. Uh, but you're also an entrepreneurial-minded guy. How long ago now did you start ERP Fixers? It's coming on two years now. Okay. So you had a dream. Well, that seems to be <laughs> that seems to be how it is. Yep. And tell tell the listeners kind of what, what your dream was and what you're inspired by. Right. So just to give some background, I have been doing SAP financials for about twenty years. So the eighteenth year, I realized that going from one client to another, even though they had an excellent system set up. They had some of the best companies do the implementation. They still didn't have the right knowledge about how to use the system effectively. And another thing that I saw was that the best companies do doesn't mean that you have the best SAP implementation and the smallest company could have excellent an excellent S SAP implementation. So I thought there is something going. There's something wrong. There's a there's a um, an even distribution of knowledge in this industry, and something can be done about it. So that coupled with the fact that we're in the age where you know things are all digital, right. things are mobile, things are in the cloud. There's a lot of flexibility, and I wanted to apply that flexibility to the SAP consultant industry. Well, and you hit on an issue that's close to home. And just for the listeners of this podcast, I want to make this clear. While this podcast is addressing some issues around SAP consulting, the, I see this as a much deeper issue. Um, pretty Definitely. much any enterprise software you can think of going back to the late 90s and the rise of the PeopleSofts and the Oracles. Correct. What we also saw was the rise of a consulting industry that I think you can make the argument didn't always really serve customers efficiently or effectively for a lot of different reasons. Either right. things were overpriced. Uh, I have the whole chip on my shoulder around layers where you have to pay a bunch of layers sometimes right. as a customer to get to the end consultant. Right. But it just didn't seem like the consulting industry was all that uh, creative and accessible to customers in the ways that they needed it. You know. Correct. And and then what we saw was we saw a real rise in. In, in cloud software that was, I think, uh, a really important step forward in, in delivering value to customers from a software perspective. But what we did not see, in my opinion, was a similar reinvention on the services side. Right. And, and to me, that's kind of where I would kind of put what you're doing in a sense. And I think it's really important to push that envelope for, for customers. And one of the things that you said that, that I put in the article that I wrote on Diginomica and by the way, we're going to get into some reader questions from that article later. You you said, uh, and I'll quote you here, even when I look at my current customers and potential customers, when they tell you about how much they're spending, you'll see that most of it is on the expertise, managing, supporting, monitoring, and consulting on SAP software as opposed to the actual licenses. Correct. It's a pretty provocative statement, but it's true, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. It is true. I've, you know, the last um, 10 years of my career has been spent going from one client to another. And most of the issues I hear about has to do with a lack of expertise. And that is um, regardless of how current and modern mm -hmm. their software application is. Right. And that skills gap, skills gap is tied into a lot of project frustration, right? Because Correct. even if the software can deliver without the proper skills, I mean, I just, I just watched you before we came in here field a ton of questions from customers that, that are difficult questions, right? And you can see right. that they don't have someone at their desk every day they can turn to like that. Correct. And these are, and you, you, as you know, I wouldn't say any names, but these are household name companies. Right. And you would think they have the resources to, to um, deal with some of these issues. But the, the fact is that, you know, there just seems to be a gap in, in the, the, the distribution of skills. And I say that because I have also gone to companies that nobody has heard of that are in SAP terms, what is called a small company, and you have, they have an excellent setup. Right. So it's not, it, there's not a direct correlation between right. um, the, the amount of money you have as a company and the amount of skills you have. It's just, the, I, I believe the customers just do not have access. They don't have easy access to where the good skills are. There's, the transparency is not there. Right, and I totally agree with that because I've, I've seen 
in my interviews with smaller customers, like I, I've started to sort of identify characteristics of what I consider to be like a successful project environment. And it includes in a nutshell, it's 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 customers that are free to get out and access the information they need. So for example, customers that are very active in user groups tend to have better projects because they're right. sending their people to shows and they're getting that gut check like the folks got in the hallway today. That's right. Uh, another example would be customers where they're not overly dependent on one prime consulting vendor and bring in independent experts, whether it's folks like yourself correct, um, who, who have project expertise or maybe it's someone who, oh, like in a specific module or area, or maybe it's an independent that can do more of an overall project audit, but the customers that are more aggressive about realizing, and look, it's not an insult to a particular prime vendor Vendor. Yeah. It's just that with these complex projects with so yeah. much at stake, yeah. you need more than one That's right. voice at the it, table. It, it's, it's paradoxical because it's it feels like the bigger the company is, the more financial resources you ha have, right. the more restricted your choice is. Right. The smaller companies, they have nothing to lose. They will yeah. go on Google. They will go to forums. They'll do all that stuff. And it, it, it broadens the um, the scope of expertise they can get. Right. And, and I think, unfortunately, I think customers are brought a little bit on this on themselves in the large corporate environments because they've they've standardized onto a handful of prime vendors for the most part. It's it's I view it as a pretty archaic procurement process in a lot of yeah, companies. Definitely. Right. Let's face it. Yes. And, and as a result of that, you have to go through the prime. So if some big company wants to hire you as a consultant in many cases you have to go through their prime vendor correct um and if you're represented by an agency in that situation you might be going through several vendors who are right. marking your your rates up right um and all this stuff just to me creates to your point it creates inefficiencies it creates uneven skills right so let's let's get into this whole issue around so so you might have some consultants on your project, but you still might not be getting your questions answered. And so one of the things yes. when you tried to set up ERP fixtures, you said to yourself, well, how do companies get their SCP questions answered right. and, and, and grow their skills? And, and what you said is that that really hasn't changed much over the years. And I'll review these things. You said get answers in SAP forums, yes. so mostly like Googling. Right. Um, hire a recruitment agency, but that's usually for full time. Yes. Then there's the consultancy, and then there's the attempt to train in-house staff. Right. Um, the problem that we run into with the Googling part is that a lot of the forum stuff that comes up is just like any internet search, the quality control issue. Right. right. So this is sort of the, the, the ingredients for what, for what ERP fixers came out of. Right. So tell us yeah. about what you intend to do there. Yeah, so quality control is a huge thing. Um, if... if if you think about what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make uh, good, skilled expertise available and accessible to SAP customers. And for me to put my name on that, for me to, to, to come out there and say that, I have to back that up with something. So one of the things we're trying to do is, and we, we've been doing it from the start, but we're trying to get better and better at it, is to make sure that the skill set on our platform is we have vetted them. We have done our due diligence to make sure that when we put them in front of a customer, they give the customer the right, they deliver what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. We also have a rating system so that you can see what other people have said about these experts. Um, so that's on the customer side. You know, they, they, will, they will also do their own, call it a review or feedback. And we're constantly doing that. That is, I believe, our only way of setting ourselves apart from a consulting industry where it's not very easy to tell whether you're getting the right service right. or not. And and in some cases, you might be in a project where you don't have the resources to hire a consultant, or maybe you just have a question that's a shorter project. It's right. more of a bite-sized thing. Right. And and you don't have an easy way of just getting someone onto your site to do that. Right. And and you're, you're tapping into a couple other trends in ERP fixtures. One is the trend towards more independent workers in general. Right. Definitely. We're, so, yeah. We're all entrepreneurial right now. That was another thing. And I, I have to say, it's not like this was such an original idea. I did look at companies like Uber, Airbnb. Right. I looked at companies where that became popular, not just because of the concept, but because we, we live in an age where people 
feel more entrepreneurial. You look at college students right now, there's a huge percentage of them that don't want to work for anyone. They want to work for themselves. And I've heard that since I started ERP Fixers say, yeah, that's great. I want to do this. And what's funny about that, I've heard it not just from people who are coming out of college or trying to get some SAP, uh, uh, use their SAP skills without working for an employer, but also for people who are heading towards retirement. That surprised me. They're saying, you know what? I do want to. Re- I do want to uh, uh, retire, but I do want once in a while to get a gig mm-hmm. here and there. So it, it's it's across the, the it it runs the whole gamut what we're trying to do, and it just shows that there's a there's a common mindset in society now that says maybe I don't have to work. You know, be in a traditional mm-hmm. work setting. Maybe I can do it. Maybe I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do something for myself. I have the skill set and. I want to have a very easy way of delivering it to a client. Right. And and the sharing economy is an interesting concept to bring into the SAP consulting space, right? And right. and and there's no denying that these these work platforms are having a huge impact. And yes. And and it's interesting from a just you look at an Uber perspective and you know, I, I'm always asking, I don't know about you, but I'm always asking the drivers, like, is this full-time? Is this part-time? Like, I want to understand how yeah. it fits into what they're doing. Right. And it, it's very interesting. And and I, I kind of always leave a little bit torn in terms of the the freedom that they have in certain ways, but then also the challenges, right? Like, it's not like we're working three or four jobs because we want to. Right. You know, so it's not like these things are perfect, but it is about taking that technology and thinking about how to apply it. Right. Um, And and you're now up to, I think, the last, you may have even gone higher than this, but I I have you at 3,600 registered SAP experts. Correct. And then 300 customers that have right. signed up. Yes. So one of the challenges with these platforms, when you study the platform economy, is getting the right level of supply and demand on, on both sides. Correct. How do you think you're doing there? Well, we're, we're trying. It's, it's, um, we, we have to, we, we're very encouraged with the number of customers that have joined the plat, the signed onto the platform. Mm-hmm. Initially, in fact, I'll give you just a little bit of history. Initially, even getting the experts to join was a little difficult. They didn't quite understand it. They said, mm-hmm. you know, it's, is, it a, is it a forum? What is it? You know, what is, there were so many questions. They didn't quite understand it. So we did a few things to clarify um, what, what we were trying to do. We made our markup, the margin we get, pretty transparent. We, we, we uh, educated them about what the platform was all about, put some things on our website so they could click on it and see, oh, this is exact. We had 10... 10 different points that every expert should know when mm-hmm. before they join the platform. So that helped. And, and a- after a while, you know, we just got a, a, a very good influx of, of experts. Um, on the customer side, we are partners with um, ASUG, um, and they have been very good in giving us exposure and uh, doing some marketing on our behalf. And we have actually had a good steady flow of customers since, um, since that happened. So we we I'm happy with with the 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 ratio of customer expert to customer right now what we're trying to do as well is it's not just enough for a customer to join the platform we're actually trying to educate those on the platform how to use it some of them have posted requests and maybe don't see it all the way through we're trying to guide them along the path mm-hmm. and you know we're constantly just trying to communicate with them ask them how we can help with their issue and if we can recommend if if it's a little too challenging for them to do it themselves or too time consuming Mm -hmm. we will suggest a few experts that can help them on their path Mm -hmm. and the process is that a customer posts a request uh you then route that to the ex appropriate expert is that is that automated or is there a human that says this should go to this person so um every expert that joins we have a list of a selection list of all the SAP modules and sub-modules. Every mm-hmm. expert, expert that joins, they tag whatever module applies to them in their profile. Right. So when a customer posts a request, one of the things they have to do is not just give the request title and description, they have to tag what area in SAP it relates to. And obviously, it's, it's, it's not... Sometimes it's a little difficult to know exactly if it's one area or several, but mm-hmm. they give a best guess. And so whatever area they tag 
the request with, it gets routed automatically to every expert we call fixers, every fixer that has Got that it. tag in their profile. However, the customer can say, you know what, even though um, I've tagged this request this way, I want to select the fixer myself. I want to look through their profile. I want to see if there's a right fit and do that. So we give that option as well. And at what point is the customer paying to be a part of the platform? So the customer pays only when they the, they are satisfied with the solution that they are given. Now, I'm going to qualify this with, with a couple of things. So first, the customer needs to have credit on the ERP fixes platform before they can select a fixer. They need to have some mm -hmm. credit. However, before having that credit, they can actually communicate with pr prospective fixers. So when they post a request, let's say they posted a request in a certain area as a SAP, 10 fixers applied for the request. They can communicate with the fixers, kind of do a soft interview just to make sure they're right. And all, all this is ba if they have mm. the time, they don't have to. But if they want to, they can do that before they select the fixer. When they select the fixer, we make sure that they have credit in their, in, on their uh, profile to select the fixer. But they don't pay, they, they, they have the credit, but the credit is not used up until mm. the solution is has been delivered to them got it <clears throat> and then once they're satisfied with the solution then they pay a certain amount of credits based on the complexity of solution and things like that and exactly. the hours worked and everything correct got it and and then you want them to review the customer because a big part of these platforms is developing some type of quality control that's that's based on peer reviews, right? Correct. So. I mean, we can only do so much upfront and I think we're doing a good job, but uh, it ultimately comes down to what cu what a customer who is looking at a fixer's profile, mm -hmm. I think there's not, there's no better, um, there's no better indication of the fixer's quality than another customer saying this fixer is good. I think we live in an age where we use that for almost every single decision. Sure. Restaurants, even employers, even teachers, doctors, everybody's being reviewed. It's unbelievable. I, I've talked about how I think that eventually there will be a number of transparent consulting sort of environments because you see it on the on the vendor side right, right. rating sites are getting more yes. and more the g2 crowds right right They're, the g2 crowds not that big in the sap world yet because right. it's kind of creeping its way a lot but but in smaller software if you checking out quickbooks for example you're heading right to a review site right um so it's i think it's going to happen over time and mm -hmm. uh one of my pals, uh, Jarrett Pazahanik, who's SAP Jarrett on Twitter, mm -hmm. whenever someone comes along like yourself that's trying to incorporate ratings, we talk about how much we need consultant ratings. He's always skeptical that people are going to be free to leave an honest response. So he's always like giving folks a hard time about that because he says, look, you're not, you're going to get positive, but mm -hmm. you're not going to, people aren't going to be willing to post critical stuff. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to have that to get an accurate yeah. rating. So yeah. did you, how did you struggle with that issue? Cause that's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. And you know, we, we don't, whatever the, um, I, the, the way we do it is this. If you, it, it's kind of like Uber. I, again, it's not like I'm copying everything from Uber, but yeah. when you when you when you use your Uber app to to call a, a, a Uber taxi, you don't see any two stars. You don't see three stars. You only see four stars, right? right. They have an algorithm that right. ranks the the drivers according to their rating. So even Got if it. even if you review have a bad review for one of our fixers we will let that review stand but what happens it just it just puts them on a low lower part of the um of the ranking when someone is searching for them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so then they have to earn their way back into that's right into ba based on an average of of based on how many good mm -hmm. uh responses they get they might rise up but that's the way mm -hmm, we do it mm -hmm. how did you tackle the the legal aspect of of a company, I mean, because the, the big difference between this and Uber, of course, is that in Uber, I'm assuming my own liability. And this, you know, a fixer gives me a suggestion to change a configuration setting in my system. Right. The system crashes or what yeah. have you. Yeah. How did you tackle that that's part? A, that's a risk. You know, before I started this, I, I, I sought out some 
what I believe is good legal advice, and yeah. we use that we use that advice to to uh, uh, put the wording, the correct wording, on our terms and agreements for the customer and the fixer as well. But it's a great question, and this happens even not just on platforms like mine, but even in the real consulting world. You could have a consultant who gives you advice which seems correct now, but down the road it it creates a, a, a huge impact. All I can say there is this: you know, we um, we I think doing the our upfront vetting. Having quality mm-hmm. control helps to mitigate that a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, from a legal aspect, if I mean we've had one or two issues where um, we haven't had something as severe as as it's someone's system crashing, but we've had some issues where um, a a fixer gave the wrong advice to um, a mm-hmm. customer. They found out it wasn't the right advice, and so what we do there is that you know in in that particular scenario. We actually communicated with the fixer and said that um, that we, you know, we we have seen you you gave totally the wrong advice, and that we we are okay. We understand that sometimes you just maybe the communication didn't work mm-hmm. out that well, and perhaps it, it that's what caused it. But this, if if we have one or two other situations like this, we can't have you on the platform, mm-hmm. and that's how we address it from the customer side. So far, like I said, I think. As long as we we we're, we're putting it in their hands to select right. the fixer, and so we are hoping that with the quality control we have and the transparency that we're giving them into that, that these are these are situations that are hopefully less than. Um, the, the, well, and I, I would think that part of that, uh, I'm trying to think from your perspective that part of that would be needing to educate customers in terms of risk management around stuff. Where start with a question that's fairly, I don't want to say trivial, but fairly right. harmless to this overall health of your system. Get to know, right. get to know the consultants, get to know the fixers, get, get more comfortable with the platform. Right. And, you know, it, look, look, I mean, you can get bad advice in almost any consulting right. situation. Right. Um, but yeah. it's just interesting to think about how, how you would do that because it's all about winning trust in the platform. Absolutely. Yes. And, and you raised an interesting point as well that I quoted you on that talked about how there's a mistrust in our industry about getting the wrong type of consultant. And right. it's, you, you said in the quote, it's, you don't have an immediate answer for it. And I kind of understand what you're talking about um, because, you know, you can go onto someone's LinkedIn profile right. and they look like an all-star consultant. Yeah. I mean, in, in the past long ago, when I was a recruiter, I'd get these resumes be like, Oh my God, this guy's amazing. Or this yeah. woman's amazing. And yeah. then, and then it's only over a longer period of time that you start yeah. to, you know, get these little pings. Hey, right. I work with this person over right. on this project. And, right. and then you start to get your own profile. But a lot yes. of times people kind of hide in plain sight, right? Where they seem to have all the right references and recommendations. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge. So, so we're, and, and that's a good point because one of the things we're doing, I think, even though I can't tell you we have the solution to this, but I can tell you that nobody does. If you look at all the other mm-hmm. avenues for hiring cons- uh, experts, whether it's a consulting firm, I don't care how big they sure. are, whether it's a recruitment agency, what are they doing? They're going on LinkedIn. They're yeah. going on LinkedIn and they're going to try to find people right. and they're putting those people in front of a customer as if those people have been totally vetted by them. But they've only just used their LinkedIn profile. Right. So we're trying to go a step Beyond that, by saying, yes, we do that, but we also have customer review. We also have the customer asking questions initially before they choose to select these um, fixers. So we're trying our best to go beyond just, hey, what's mm-hmm. on paper may or may not reflect your actual skill set. And and one thing is that you have like quick turnaround on this, which is, I think, a key part of your equation, right? Because right. you you want this to be a little bit like search where it has an immediacy to it. So right. so each request someone puts in as a deadline for every hour that they allocate on for the project in mind, the question in mind, they have 12, the 12 hours for the fixer to respond. Yes. The customer can control that, but right. the, they're going into it knowing they're going to get a pretty quick response, which yeah. is a big part of, I think, the 
reason for doing this versus versus a more traditional channel. Right. right? That's definitely a, a, a need for that. And I do know there are some downsides to that. SAP is a complex system. It's not one that you can, you can always get an easy answer. But right. I, we needed to do that to also give the fixers a sense of urgency. One of the reasons why I introduced that is because you go on SCN, just, just you browse SCN and I'm not knocking SCN, but if you look at mm-hmm. when the question was posted and the question was answered, sometimes this week, sometimes this month, Sometimes it's years. You know, there's no urgency for the person answering the question. Mm. And that's because obviously they're not being remunerated for doing it. And there's no, ne- not necessarily any incentive for them to right. get back on time. I wanted to take that out of the qu- equation. Yeah, that makes sense. And you do some upfront ver- validation and verification of folks. Right. What did you figure out there? Is is it there's some reference checking kind of things? or Sometimes there's reference checking. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to use, I have... Um, a few people working on the upfront validation. Sometimes mm-hmm. we use our in- intuition. Sometimes we look at the LinkedIn profile. If we think mm-hmm. something's a little off on it, we ask for some ex- some backup. We communicate mm-hmm. with the with the um, potential expert. We could ask for a reference or something else beyond what they're, we can see on their LinkedIn profile. So that is more like uh, an evolving process because we are learning. The more we validate, the more we learn. And mm-hmm. our we are getting to the point, we're not quite there yet, but I would like to have a database of experts that we can vouch for. And we're trying to do certain mm-hmm. things to make that happen. I'll give you one example. We haven't implemented it yet, but one of the things in conjunction with a a business partner of mine, we may be introducing random testing for our experts. That's Mm -hmm. one of the things we're trying to do. Random testing meaning in order for them to be ranked on our website, they would need to answer about 20 questions in a specific SAP sub-module that Mm -hmm. are those questions will be delivered randomly within a certain time period for them to answer it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're we're thinking of introducing to help this quality control. Got it. And then, and then hopefully, hopefully the ratings, if it, if it goes well, that accomplishes a lot of it because it, like you said, there's an algorithmic aspect as well that kicks in. Right. Um, Now, one of the things that I think readers have been wondering about is what kinds of questions, right? Because you think, like one of the big objections I was getting from readers like were saying, I don't know if this will work. They were saying like, mm-hmm. there's so much nuance to a project and, and you know, how can you get that across? But it seems like there would be some SAP questions that you could answer without knowing a whole lot about a particular environment. So what are there certain questions that you've noticed or the kinds of things that work well for this or, you know, I don't, f- first of all, I think, I, I've I've been doing this in the SAP field for 20 years, yeah. I, and I'm not not just in the SAP field. In what I think is the toughest part of the SAP field, which is, which is FI and CO, it's tougher yeah. than all the other modules because we, with FI and CO, when you think you have an answer, if logistics thinks it's okay, it's not okay till FI CO says it is. So I've yeah. dealt with the most skeptical, cynical customers who do not believe an answer until. It, until they've gone through, it's gone through a very rigorous process. So I say that because one of the things that helps to mitigate the understanding of an issue is a good consultant. A good consultant, mm-hmm. when they're presented with a question, they can figure out if what the customer is saying is exactly what their issue is or what the customer is saying represents what the customer thinks their issue is and the expertise of the expert is what determines if that is the issue or not. And mm-hmm. so if, on, on, that, on that note, the question is, okay, do I have the experts on the platform who have that sense of, um, identifying these nuances? And the answer is yes. We have, I mean, it seems like just because it's a, 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 a on-demand platform that I'm probably getting mediocre people who can get a better gig. Mm. But no, we are in a, right now, you and myself, John, are at a conference with some of the best skilled FICO experts around. Right. At least five of them are on the platform. Right. So it's, I think having the right experts 
will mm-hmm. deal with the issue of whether this is really an issue that um, um, that requires a quick fix or if it's a longer issue. So just one I more see. thing to say that on that. That makes sense. One more thing to say on that is that some of the issues, the customer, I think this is a quick issue. It turns out it's a longer issue. In those situations, we actually, we give the customer the option either to deal with the issue through ERP fixers or they or we can mm-hmm. just guide them along the way and they can go get help from somewhere else because maybe they have a mm-hmm. preferred vendor or some other option that they have. So we have that flexibility as well. Uh, what are the average years of experience of folks in your platform? Have you looked at that yet? or Haven't looked at the average yet, mm-hmm. but we say a minimum of three years Got SAP it. experience to be on the platform. But we have, you know, we, we have a range of experts on the platform from people with three years experience to people like myself with 20 or over year, tw- right. 20 or over years experience. So it really depends. One other thing with this, which is why I like, I like the format of being able to post, not just to say I need an expert in FICO, but I need an expert who knows how to do a payment run or knows how to diagnose an error on a specific pay- payment run for wire payments. The reason I like that is because someone with three years experience may know specifically about mm-hmm. how to diagnose that than myself with 20 years experience. Right, and they so, may have some version experience you don't have or some exactly. industry thing you don't have. So, yeah. so, so breaking these issues into these bite-sized chunks, I think makes it more makes the expertise less dependent on, oh, I have 20 years of experience. I got to tell you, I, I, I have 20 years of experience, but sometimes that's a hindrance as much as it's yeah. you know, uh, um, um, a, a skill. Well, and it sounds like a bit of education for, for your customers on the platform in terms of how to ask a question that has enough like specifics like that to really nail the right person for it. Correct. Yes. I, I need an FICO consultant is so generic to be useless. Absolutely. You know, whereas if, like you said, if you had some very specific payment run issue, whatever you can. Right. And, and I think another really important point about what you're doing, that's a little bit different than like, for example, in the nineties, I, I was part of a project called virtual bench where we were trying to basically cut out the middle person, which is one thing we have in common with sort of what you're doing. I okay. mean, you're a little bit of a middle person, but right, right. but not like a, like a right. series of consulting yeah. layers. layers. Yeah. Um, and you know, the difference with our thing, which was called virtual bench at the time was that we wanted to have, this was going to be a different way to pr- procure an on-site consultant. We weren't right. thinking about on online. Okay. And to your point, like the reason you could potentially get some really senior people on your platform is because they might want to have some extra stuff on the side. Like, yes. So they might have, you're not trying to replace conventional consulting. No. In fact, you, you went so far as to say that this is not going to be a model for everyone, for all customers' consulting issues. They should still have internal IT. They should still have yeah. consulting firms. And um, if, if you need them, uh, recruiting, if you need it, but that you think there's there's a space for this as well. Correct. You know? Yes. So, so and, and the real time is a big part of it, right? Right. It, it's, it's almost like a Google search with a human on the other end of it. <laughs> an AI, an AI, yeah. which is not a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's take a look here. Um, had a couple of questions from readers here. Um, so Michael, Michael Doan, who is, uh, do you know Michael? I don't know him. Michael, no. Michael's been active in, in SAP for a long time and he's, uh, written a number of books uh, on SAP consulting. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a book on SAP consulting with Michael a long time Mm -hmm. ago, but he's written a book called The Blue Book and The Green Book, which have to do with like maturity of SAP Mm -hmm. and training Mm -hmm. and change management. Mm -hmm. He's pretty skeptical about about reform in the service industry, but he said, um, he said, I read this article with great interest, but it seems that while the aim to reduce consulting layers, response time and the like are admirable, there's a fundamental flaw in the approach. Mm-hmm. Experience tells us when a client posts a request, the first response of a respons- responsible consultant is to reframe the request until it makes sense. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. short, clients don't know what 
what they don't know at least right. 60% of the time. Mm -hmm. This reframing is often at the heart of real consulting. I'm also very suspicious of most attempts to provide, quote, flexibility for quick solutions, mm -hmm. unless the subject is limited to some version of application support. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, but he says, having yeah. said that, I trust your instincts, and so he'll gladly follow the effort. <laughs> um, that's a good question. It's a, it's a very good question. And, you know, it. I mean, that is the first part of the question is kind of relates to my my previous comment about having the right expertise. So I'll count, I'll, I will kind of um, rephrase that question in my own way, which is that, that reframing uh, a client's question because the client does not know what they don't know could happen whether you're using ERP fixers or whether you're on site with a client. That That's a consulting thing. It takes the right type of consultant to be able to drill down into an issue and identify whether is this the issue, does the issue, the, the way the client presents it, is that the real issue or is that just what the client sees? Are there other things around that? So that is, the answer to that question is, who is on the other end of that request? Is mm. it somebody who's just going to jump in and say, click on this button and that button, and that's the answer to your question? Or is this somebody who's gonna say, no, let's look, let's look at the context of this issue and see if there's something that you're missing, which is why you're presenting it this way. So that to me falls mm. to, um, to the expertise of the consultant. It has nothing, in my opinion, has nothing to do with whether you do that on ERP fixers or if you, ha if you mm -hmm. do that by hiring somebody from a consulting firm. So you're basically else. saying that if, if, if a, a good fixer would come back to the client and ask those kinds of oh, clarifications yeah. and stuff, rather than just take a question and try to answer it right away, they might come back with a clarification Absolutely. and so on. And that happens yeah. a lot because like I said, when a when a, mm -hmm. when a client posts an issue, there is a period before they select the fixer where there's communication between them. Okay, sometimes the communication is, hey, you said this is going to take five hours. I can tell it's going to take 10. But sometimes the issue is, could you give us something clearer? That right. happens a lot. That makes sense. Yeah. The second part, and so that was the first. The second part was, I think, a question about, you know, calling this a quick, flexible platform may not reflect how things work in SAP. For that, call, when, when I use the term quick and flexible, that doesn't mean quick solutions. Mm. That means giving customers quick and flexible access to expertise. Whatever communication goes on between them depends on the nature of the question. But the idea here is make sure that expertise is more transparent. And as I said, I don't see any other, um, I don't see any other consultant based format out there that says beyond what's on your resume or the references, we give you access to checking out these experts and and validating them before you can use them. Right. Uh, and I just want to clarify, Michael Dunn, I want to make sure I did a better job of, uh, I think the book I always want people to check out is the SAP Green Book, but what it's basically about is looking at uh, how to thrive after go live. Basically the go live of product is just the beginning and yeah. it's about it business alignment. So anyway, right. for, for your listeners, I just wanted to get Michael's plug, right? Um, since Michael and I go way back and I wanted to be mad at me. <laughs> um, okay. And then, um, uh, Martin English, who also I go way back with, he's, uh, uh, basis expert based out of Australia. Okay. And he says, I've tried working with these models in the past. The major mm -hmm. breakdown and in solving the problems is the logistics surrounding access to the system. For example, if the work is defined as write this functionality on SAP system, mm -hmm. there are things as basic as whether the appropriate pieces of software are available. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes into an example about web code and BSP. Do they have mm -hmm. Gateway or Fiori installed? Blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Do they write releases? If the customer wants a performance problem solved, uh, et cetera, but the real cause is XYZ processing more data, and the only real answer is the need to reduce the data or increase the size of the box. Mm -hmm. You can't see the bigger picture without access to the customer's SAP system, mm -hmm. and customers are loath to provide this to an ad hoc person selected from a web page. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then uh, he goes on to say, this doesn't even touch on the hard part of paperwork involved in getting paid and making sure your ducks are in a row for tax purposes. Uh, I need to know I had a lot of five-day gigs to go through the process of setting up a U.S. payment method, and he has struggled to work that out 
uh, mm-hmm. from the customer side. So I think the last piece has to do with the international mm-hmm. commerce part, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but maybe just the that first part around yeah. this access to the system and stuff. Yeah, what do that, you think of that? Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to say there's a there's a common, it's a basis question, right? It's I mean, a basis question. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's a theme with both questions that with both uh, uh, qu- read the readers' questions, which is that because this is a platform of consultants which is online that somehow the consultants themselves are in a more kind of diminished position expertise wise mm. than a normal consultant because the first the, the first question says um um how do you, how do you um how is the uh, consultant going to give you the right advice when they haven't looked in the system the answer is they can look in the system if you hired somebody to to your um to your firm to your company and you wanted them to you gave them some information about what the issue is and they didn't fully understand you'll give them access to your system from a legal standpoint would you just say hey here's my here's the access to the system probably not you'll <laughs> say well you have to sign the, you have to sign something or we have to do some kind of validation on check mm-hmm. on you before we give you access, it's exactly the same thing. We have aerospace and defense companies on our platform, and they don't let anybody look at their system without signing something, and that happens. So the access mm-hmm. that people get, if it gets to that point, right? If it gets to the point where mm-hmm. the information is not being understood, the fixer says, I would need access to your system. At that point, the client would say, you know, we can't give you access, but we'll send you screenshots. Or let's do a screen share. Or we will give you access. And we've had all that stuff happen. Mm-hmm. And what my advice for clients, because I've been asked this question by from from companies that um, that are in ind- sensitive industries that don't just allow any access. Sure. Those comp- my what I tell them, which is what my my legal advice told me, is that whatever protocol you undergo to give a consultant access to your system is the same thing you should do here. We cannot guarantee Mm. anything outside what your normal protocol is. You know, what's interesting about this is it looks like this is also where folks may be getting a little confused in terms of that applying the sharing economy to the SAP space or the really could be any ERP because I I would Mm. imagine eventually you're going to expand beyond SAP. That's just a (laughs) guess. That's the hope, Um, but we'll see. But, um, it's not going to ever be as convenient as like Uber or like Amazon overnight as far as like, well, maybe it will be in certain cases, but in general, what you're saying is there's some seriousness to this. It's not just like, oh, five minutes later, I have an answer or 30 minutes later, you're, you're on my system, you know, right. it's like, no, you're going to have to, unfortunately, because of of the risk issues and the security issues involved. Right. There's always going to be some hoops to jump through. Yeah. Like maybe you can make those easier through biometrics or whatever it is. Right. But the point is that that's, it's not, you don't want to give people the impression that, that this is just such a quick fix. No. It, you actually do go through the same hoops that you would in a sense, if you were putting a consultant on site in a lot of ways. The, 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 yeah. And that, Obviously, depending on the issue. So yeah, what, what yeah, this yeah. does, what the, the and you know, it's been two years. We've had enough uh, scenarios and, and evolutions for me to tell you that I've seen most of these um, 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 questions or scenarios that have been brought up. We, we've seen them. So what happens is this. What we are trying to say is this. Ideally, we would have a process that matches what you're saying, which is, hey. You get a question, is everything's understood between both parties, boom, you get an right. answer. And but that's not always the case, especially in a system like SAP. SAP is an right. en- enterprise resource planning system. You could <laughs> the consequences of incorrect advice or giving someone access to your system who shouldn't a- have access, that, you know, th- those consequences are really dire. I mean, we're talking about sure. the biggest companies in the world use SAP. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's huge. However, what, what, what I think we're ahead of the pack is that we are saying before you get to that, if you have to get to that stage, that's fine. But we want to smooth the process. So maybe you don't need someone to access your system. Maybe there's enough understanding of the issue that they can see what a lot of stuff, mm. a lot of what goes on is that the fixer goes ahead and creates a document with screenshots and everything and sends it to the client. And that's great. 
that's one way of doing it. Another way is that, well, the fixer needs more information. So have a screen sharing session. Right. Sometimes that doesn't work. Then it goes to the next level, which is that we need to give you access. So hopefully, I mean, it, it works better for us if it's the first scenario that happens because then we know we're churning through so many different mm -hmm. issues and requests and the, the platform is running as the way it will. But we're dealing with... a. I don't want to. I don't want to be. I know I'm on record for saying this. I'm going to use the term dinosaur. I don't want to use the term dinosaur on SAP, but not yeah. SAP itself. But the process around how yeah, SAP yeah. is used is still somewhat antiquated. We're trying to make some of those right streamline some of that, and ideally, at some point, you know, we will be right. introducing tools that make some of this. Um, much more streamlined. Let me give you one example. It's in the pipeline for maybe a year or so, a couple of years, is that we could actually start validating the fixers, doing uh, um, uh, whatever validation checks that pub uh, certain companies do themselves. We could do that on certain fixers and have that on their profile that their security cleared or they're cleared for some validation check or the other. So the customer doesn't need to do it. We can't do it right now, but that's the kind of thing that we can build on from having a platform like this. And then you have one other new um, innovation coming up, which has to do with teams, right? Right, right. So what's that about? So um, we have, uh, obviously, we've, we have the on-demand platform, which is the, um, you know, you can you're free to post a question and route it to an expert. We also have an optimization service. And this optimization service was actually came from a couple of customers' requests because they said, you know, we have, we don't even have an issue, but we know that we're not doing things right. Can mm -hmm. you get someone on your platform or a few people on your platform to help us out with this? So, I, when I, the first time I was asked, I just thought, uh, you know, that's not really what we do. You know, mm. we're giving you, we're putting things in your hands to, to, to choose who you want. But it's like, you know, wait a minute. We have, and we, we are validating these experts. We're probably doing, you know, as good a job as any other firm, maybe even better, hopefully. So we have the expertise. We know exactly what modules they're in. We can actually search for the right expertise ourselves. And, we, we, we have their location. So if it's a U.S. company, obviously mm -hmm. this will only work for someone in the U.S. We have their location. We know how close they are to the client. So why don't we do that? And then we also act as almost a, um, a, a, a validation process. As in, we, we interview these guys. We actually talk to, the, we'll talk to the fixers and say, you know, we're going to, you know, this is the requirement. Can you, um, can you, uh, 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 do you want to be part of it? And do you qualify? And so what we're doing with these optimization exercises is that the client reaches out to us. They could post a request or reach out to us. We do the selection ourselves and we provide mm -hmm. the team. Sometimes we provide, the, it doesn't need to be on, on site. Sometimes it, it still is remote, but we are providing the team. And that is something that what we notice with that, the difference between that and the, the normal platform is the people asking for these are actually the decision makers of the company. They're the, the ones more looking at the strategic outlook of the company regarding the system and not just fix one thing, fix another thing. And so that that um, optimization service is something we're building on. We've had a lot of good interest on it. And, you know, it's just basically us using the experts in the database to help mm. um, to help satisfy customer requests. Just another another thing about that, which I think. Um, I like is that when we suggest the experts, we actually t tell the clients that they can go on this platform and check out the expert profile. We've done our validation, but we're also giving them the freedom to go ahead and, you know, we have details on their bio, their LinkedIn, all that stuff. If mm. they wanted to have a second check, hasn't happened that way yet, but um, we, they have the flexibility to do that. There's no like obvious restrictions, but there are certain nuanced restrictions. For example, there are some industries that our customers, that, that there's some customers in certain industries on our platform who you have to be a green card holder right. or a yeah, citizen. Yeah. They have very specific requirements. Yeah, before right. you can even look at their system. Right, yeah. And, and if someone really likes 
your fixer and they want to bring them on for consulting or perm, do you have arrangements set up where that can happen? Or Well, that's happened a couple of times. Not Oh, actually, yeah, it, it, for, I was going to say not perm, but we've actually had perm. We've actually mm. just placed a, a perm. It, it does happen. It's it, it, These are those kind of things that I didn't anticipate. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I was thinking... Hello, dude. I, yeah, I was thinking... If someone likes someone, yeah, that's it's right. going to happen. They do. So, so that yeah. does happen. It's few and far between, and it's, it is not the purpose of It's not of the, common. It's yeah. not common, but it does happen. But you and, can make arrangements if it does yeah, happen. Yeah, we okay. make arrangements, yeah, and yeah. you know, we wouldn't say no. If, if, the, if the terms are right, we, we do agree. We Got will it. go with that. Well, we could probably talk longer, but I have a hunch we've reached a point of diminishing returns. But I appreciate okay. such a transparent conversation, and I'm sure our listeners will too. Paul, thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks a lot, John. 